So good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm Dr. Wes Jackson, Program Manager for the UH Center for Public History, and I am very happy to welcome you to our virtual workshop on how to start a history podcast. At the Center for Public History, our vision is to ignite an understanding of our diverse pasts by collaborating with and training historically minded students, practitioners, and the public through community driven programming and scholarship. Today's event and all of our CPH lecture series events will be recorded and posted to our website. To learn more about CPH, please visit that website at uh.edu slash class slash CPH. For our workshop this evening, I have the privilege of introducing our guest speaker, uh, Dr. Edward O'Donnell. Dr. O'Donnell is Associate Professor of History at Holy Cross College in Worcester, Massachusetts. He is a historian of 19th century US urban, ethnic, and political history and public history. Dr. O'Donnell hosts the American History Podcast, In the Past Lane, which was launched in January of 2016. And tonight he will be sharing his story of starting and developing the podcast, the resources needed to maintain it, and how he's involved students in different aspects of the production. Dr. O'Donnell's presentation will be followed by a Q&A session, and we'll be looking to wrap up the whole event around 7.30. So without further ado, I will go ahead and turn the floor over to you, Dr. O'Donnell. All right, thank you. Um, I'm gonna quickly share my screen. So the first question is, can you see my screen? Everything look good? All right, great. Give me one more moment here to orient the... Uh, one last thing over here, okay. All right. I find if I don't change the position of the uh, of the of of myself and, and the few few squares I see on the screen, I end up staring off to the to the to the side. So I'm um, using trying to use good good zoom etiquette. Well, anyway, thank you all uh, so much. My name is Ed O'Donnell, and uh, I'm uh, well. I'll, I think I'll jump to my next slide, which is gives me gives you a quick little. Quick little um, bio. So I'm a, in one respect, a typical college professor, a historian. I teach at a small liberal arts college in central Massachusetts. Um, teach American history courses, and uh, for the next 111 days and five hours, I will be the chair of the history department. And I'm kind of looking forward to not being that uh, in that position. Um, so in that respect, I'm, I'm kind of a traditional historian and and college professor. But for some reason. For a long, long time, or from the very beginning, I should say, um, I've always been inclined towards what it didn't. I don't even. Well, I guess it had a name. I didn't know what the name was uh, until Earl at, at a certain point that it was called public history. You know, the history that you uh, can have a scholarly side and do research and publish articles in scholarly journals that fellow historians will read and maybe a graduate student here or there, but um, kind of a you know, not not exactly for the masses. But then to also have a side of you that is a person that would. Uh, give public talks that would, um, well, I mean, one of the things that got me into it was how to get through graduate school. Um, I started a walking tour business with another graduate student. So we, we gave several thousand walking tours in New York City uh, in the 1990s. And, uh, you know, that's a great way to teach, to learn how to teach and also to, you know, how do you use a, how do you use a built environment to convey history and social history and all that. So, um, and then I did, you know, public radio with NPR and a lot of museum uh, exhi exhibitions and such. So before long, I guess I became a, a public historian. And so I've always liked, loved that aspect of, of my career and my profession. And I also, you know, from a very early age, love, have always loved radio and loved, you know, media. And so when podcasts came along, I was that guy who, you know, would be at a cocktail party and say, hey, have you heard about podcasts? And nobody would know what I was talking about. And then eventually the rest of the world, you know, caught up. So from an early, I was an early adopter and uh, very early on at some point I said, you know, I do all this other public history stuff. What about a history, you know, public history uh, podcast? So that's really what, mm -hmm. what, um, what led to um, in the past lane. And uh, there's my logo. And so um, I launched it back in 2016, the year that I was on sabbatical. So I had a little bit uh, more time and I didn't really know what I was doing. I knew what I wanted to do and I knew enough partly because I consume so much NPR uh, that I kind of knew the feel and the sound and the how to mix music in between segments and things like that. So um, I had an idea of what I wanted 
you know, the podcast to sound like, but I really didn't know a whole heck of a lot about the technology, about, um, you know, all the many things that I was going to have to subsequently learn to be able to, to, to put this thing out on a, on a fairly regular basis. Um, it has been a lot of fun and I've, I've learned a ton and slowly but surely I built my audience, um, got to the point where I was just about to do, uh, to take on my first little bit of commercial advert, you know, advertisers, not to make a ton of money, but to uh, pay my bills, you know, because it does cost a little money to produce and maintain a, a podcast. Um, and then the pandemic hit. So all of that's been kind of put on hold. If you go to my podcast, you'll see that the last episode was from, I think, last July. Uh, and I just did basically a COVID pause because COVID has caused me to take on other responsibilities and leaves me with even less time. So for the time being, it's, it's, a, it's a podcast on hiatus, um, which in some ways is kind of an interesting thing. You know, you can't have a radio show and put it on hiatus, but you can do that uh, with a podcast. And so the podcast has brought me great joy and, and it's also got me great opportunities. And I can tell you, show you just one. Um, that's Peter. So the young people in the crowd, you may not know that that's Peter Sagel, but for anybody over the age of 40, Peter Sagel's kind of a cool guy, um, host of uh, NPR's uh, popular show, Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me. Anyway, the producer of this show called History with Peter Sagel um, was looking for a sidekick historian. And so he, but he was, and he was listening to history podcasts and he ended up finding mine. And long and the short of it, I did a four episode history program with Peter Sagel in a really cool Washington DC whiskey bar. So um, it was a pretty fun, you know, I didn't make any, didn't make any money on it, but it was just a, a heck of a lot of fun. And um, it's been a fun thing to, you know, people still contact me about how much they enjoy the series and so forth. So you never know what kind of unexpected fun things uh, can happen from it. I also got a chance to interview, uh, because I'm, I'm a historian and I've inter interviewed a lot of historians about their new books. I think I interviewed four or five Pulitzer Prize winning historians um, about their books and, you know, um, including Gordon Wood and, and uh, many others. So that's a kind of a fun, uh, I guess, extra thing. Oh, Ken Burns, also the, the famous documentary filmmaker. So let's start with um, the reasons not to make a podcast or any of any sort. So uh, because there's a lot of illusion out there, people know that podcasts are super popular and that um, many a famous person has a podcast now and many people seem to be doing quite well by them. And so a lot of people, I've, in, during these presentations, people have asked the first question out of the gate before I started putting this segment in is, uh, how soon can you start making money? You know, and so the number one reason not to make to do a podcast is to make money because, you know, unless your name is um, Britney Spears or Barack Obama or something else, you, you know, the they're not, they're not the only ones who can make money, but they're the only ones who can expect to make money immediately, like that they have kind of fame and cachet and a huge audience and so forth. So going in with the idea that it's it's going to bring a, bring in even a modest amount of cash is, you know, I had to work four years to get my my download numbers up to a point where I could get a couple of advertisers that might make me 200 bucks a month, which would effectively pay my bills. So it's a, you want to go in with more, um, more artistic, more um, personal kind of goal oriented, something beyond money. Um, and you might get lucky, you never know, but uh, you're not going to become Dan Carlin. He's the, probably the richest, he's not a historian, but he does a history podcast, Hardcore History. He in fact does make millions and millions and millions of dollars <laughs> and has a million, more, several million downloads per episode, but that is, uh, the, he's the rarity. Um, nor will you immediately become famous. So even if you don't make a lot of money, uh, you aren't gonna have like huge fan following and, uh, and so forth, or, or let's put it this way, it's, it's very unlikely that you will hit a million downloads per episode uh, like this guy, I don't know if you recognize the guy in, in the foreground of that uh, shot on the lower right, but that's Ira Glass, host of This American Life on NPR. Um, he in fact does get several million downloads per episode, and he's probably one of the most famous uh, podcasters, one of the godfathers of the, uh, of the craft. Um, you might get there someday, but uh, it's good to have no illusions about how quickly, you know, you can, you, you'll gain traction and take off. Now, while we're talking about downloads per episode, um, this is a good point to point out, like setting realistic goals. So um, when you see that people, you know, get 4,000 downloads, 10,000 downloads, a million downloads, and then you launch your podcast and you're getting, you know, let's say after a couple of months, you get up to a hundred and it seems so, so piddly. And so like, is this even worth it? And I learned early on from one of my 
podcast gurus, a guy named Dave Jackson, who I'll talk about a little bit later, he said, you know, you could think of that as a really small number, but you could also say to yourself, if you're a teacher, you know, 25 kids a class, you're ba if you have 100 people listening to your podcast every week, that means you're teaching basically four classrooms full of people. Or if you said, if you're a preacher, you know, it's basically a full, a full church, 100 people, you know, that, those, that's, that's pretty darn good. You know, you're reaching people, they clearly are coming back. So in some ways, it's really good to kind of reframe what, what constitutes success when it comes to uh, a podcast. Because otherwise, you know, if you have illusions of huge downloads, it's, you're going to, I mean, the, a, a, one of the terms in the trade is called pod fade. You, you start out with great guns and then you lose all your oomph. Um, one way to lose your oomph is to have unrealistic expectations about downloads and about like what your purpose is. So speaking of purpose, another one of my guru friends, um, this is one of his go-to things. He says, when you're thinking about starting a podcast, uh, here's the things you shouldn't be thinking about. But there, the main thing is like, why are you going to do this? Um, this is, you know, a really fundamental question. You could apply this to all kinds of things in your life. But what's your why? Why do you want to do it? Um, there's lots of possible possible reasons why to do it, right? So in the in the realm of history, let's focus on that for a moment. One is you might, you know, one way to think about podcasting is it's like learning to play the guitar, or it's taking up um, watercolors, or some kind of artistic craft. And you're not really you don't really care so much about how what kind of impact you have, you're just enjoying the, the doing, right? You're enjoying the wood carving, you're enjoying the, whatever that craft might be. Uh, and you might just be perfectly content to do this as, as a solo project, which is what I did. I did, did it uh, on my own. Although um, if you listen to my podcast, you hear me banter with a, with a producer who's a, a very grumpy producer. And that's actually my oldest, uh, second oldest daughter who uh, is an actor. So she voiced a very angry producer lady so that I would have, I could have a little light moment at the beginning and the end of each episode. Um, so what if another good reason to start a podcast would be like you have a special passion. So you want to do a podcast about history of beer or in, in the case of uh, what I hear, understand one of your projects there is, you know, local history, looking at uh, trying to develop uh, a podcast based around the, the neighborhood, based around a, a particular region or a history of, I mean, if you go through the podcast episode or podcasts at iTunes, I mean, there is literally a podcast for everything. If you like knitting, there's a thousand podcasts, but if you like knitting using one particular kind of, you know, style and needles and maybe one kind of wool, there's a, there's a podcast for that. You know, like niche is like, there's niche within niche within niche. Um, I, I once uh, heard an interview with a guy who does, he's a, he raises chameleons and he, he has a chameleon podcast and he actually makes money off of it, even though he gets only like 800 people to listen to it uh, because he sells equipment. He builds chameleon cages and they're really, they're custom built. So anyway, it's an interesting thing. Think about what you're, what, the, what the, is their motivation? Another history motivation might be that you're doing it, you're boosting an institution or you're assisting or helping an institution or you're part of an institution that seeks to have a different way of reaching the public and different way of doing things, whether it's a museum or a historical society um, or a public history program. Um, another is collecting oral histories. You know, the, the old way of doing oral histories is you interview people before they die and you collect that uh, recording, then you transcribe it. Um, and then it goes into an archive where it can be accessed by somebody at some point. Uh, and that's awesome. As a historian, those things are just, they're like gold. Um, but what about having oral history available through a podcast medium uh, and also editing them so that they can become more, more digestible? So just to give you one example, um, Making Gay History, a very popular uh, podcast. And the guy that does, did, does that podcast, his archive is something he created back in the 90s. He interviewed um, hundreds of, of gay Americans about their experiences and you know, sort of their bios. And at one point about four or five years ago said, I'm sitting on this gold mine of audio from a, the 90s, you know, right as the, uh, in the, you know, when the AIDS epidemic was raging and, and so forth. Anyway, he's taken all those tapes and cut them all up and turned them into this fantastic podcast. Um, you know, he might take a five hour interview and cut it down to 45 minutes. So uh, oral history can have a kind of a new dimension uh, through podcasting. Um, you can, as I mentioned, you can tell local history, whether that's just figuring out and telling the stories that happened at such and such corner or in this, this saloon, or talking to the people who are there right now and telling the, you know, the history of that neighborhood through the, the people that have been there uh, for some time. And then teaching. 
getting your students to uh, to podcast and to think about that as a, um, a kind of a different kind of, you know, because it's a it's an assignment that can involve writing. It, it involves learning new technology. It's also a digital skill. Uh, it has many many features to it, and also students are very leery of it, and then they love it. <laughs> they they take ownership of it and find that. Uh, you know, that they actually don't mind listening to their own voice and they can get good at editing things and get more relaxed behind the microphone and also pairing their podcast with and using things like uh, music and such. All right, so what kind of history podcast? Well, there are, as we've already, I guess I've already sort of touched on it. There are all kinds of different ones that, that one could pursue. So to give you, uh, you know, one of the most obvious ones is an interview podcast. So my podcast mostly was an interview podcast, interviewing historians, about their most recent books. Um, ben Franklin's World, you see the image there, that's also an interview uh, podcast. Um, storytelling, so crafting stories from history in a compelling way, and nobody in the world does it better than Nate DeMeo, who is the uh, proprietor of the Memory Palace. Um, that's his, his, that's his full-time job. He is an, an, a, an extraordinary storyteller, often telling stories that are sort of hidden stories in American history, but connect to bigger, uh, to bigger themes. He's got an incredible voice and an incredible ability to pull together narrative and music. And um, I, you will fall in love with the Memory Palace if you, if you give it a shot. Um, true Crime. True Crime is one of the fastest growing podcast categories. And it's definitely one of the fastest growing history podcast um, uh, categories. Huge, huge interest. And that's In the Dark is an example um, of, that, of that kind. Another is documentary. So telling you know, a, a six part story or eight part story on something. So Dr. Death um, is a podcast that uh, came out a couple of years ago and tells pretty un unbelievable story about medical malpractice. And there are just hundreds and hundreds of examples um, of that, thousands I should say. Uh, travel, travel in history, you can see the example there, the Tudor History Travel Show. And uh, that's, a po that's a possibility because a lot of reasons why people like travel is that it connects to the history. And uh, comedy. There's all you know. We know the the, sh the show Drunk History. There's many others that sort of take history and use it as kind of a prop for uh, for humor. So there are, and that I don't know. If, I don't think I've covered them all, but there's a big, wide range of you know of, of history podcasts. So what are the rules of podcasting? This is super important because there is so much misinformation out there. And I got the here's the good news. There are no rules. <laughs> um, so it, or there's one rule, and this is my friend Dave Jackson. Um, again, he said that the number one answer, the, he says the answer to almost every podcasting question is, it depends, right? So what is, um, hang on, I gotta move. Yeah, format, what's the, what's the ideal format? You know, is it interview, is it storytelling, all those things I just said? And the answer is, it depends, really. All of them are successful. Um, every kind of, every format out there has leading super successful popular uh, podcast. So it's not what, there's no magic format. It's really content and quality uh, of content. Mm -hmm. um, say length of episodes. Now this is one you'll hear all kinds of quote unquote gospel on and all kinds of studies saying the ideal podcast is 22 minutes because that's based on research about attention spans. Well, Dan Carlin, who was on the screen a little while ago, Hardcore History, he has episodes that are nine hours long, unbroken audio, nine hours. And there are podcasts that are super successful that are five minutes in length. So again, what, what's the difference? Dan can do that because he's amazing. He's an incredible storyteller, incredible researcher. He just knows what he's doing uh, and he does it incredibly well. That's why people will listen. They, I don't know how many people listen to actually nine straight, but they will listen in long bender, um, you know, bingey type uh, sessions. And, and the little five minute nugget ones are, are great too. So um, length of episodes really depends on quality. My interviews with historians tended to run about 45 minutes or at least 40 minutes. That's a long interview, but you know, people, people loved them because it was history. The other thing was historian talking to historian. I think that was another feature that people liked that I wasn't just asking sort of interesting journalist questions. I was able to kind of get into the weeds a little bit and ask them about their research and so forth. Um, so length of episodes, there's no, there's no magic number. It's about quality of the content. Frequency of episodes, do you have to drop one every week, every month, every, I mean, it, in some ways it does suggest that a, a regular drop is a good thing, but um, for some folks and some institutions, that's just not possible. So, you know, what, um, 
I mean, Nate DeMeo, for example, the, uh, the memory palace, he drops an episode whenever he's done. So he, six weeks can transpire before he drops his next episode, but he's so good. People don't just, nobody unsubscribes because he, he hasn't dropped something that just sort of heightens the anticipation. Um, and another thing that, that many folks have done to get out of that 52 weeks a year or you know, 26, you know, dropping something every, that kind of pressure schedule is seasons. This was a brilliant thing where somebody just said, how about if I just do 12 episodes and I call that season one? And then I take four months off and then I do another 12 or 16 or eight. And then it becomes season two. And that is a really brilliant, like um, help yourself out. Don't, don't drive yourself into the ground kind of method. I never got there, but I, I you know, during this time off, my reboot of in the past lane might include is likely to include something like that, and there and that might lend lend suggest to me that I should do something more thematic, right? Not just twelve interviews with historians. Maybe I'll do twelve on on uh, the the um, the American Revolution, and then twelve on um, the struggle for civil rights, uh, or even three on on the history of policing in America. You know, you could do this is the beauty of it. There's no you're not radio. You are radio, but you're not radio, so you can kind of do anything you want. Um, now, <laughs> here comes the reality check, time. Um, time is, the, the one thing about podcasting is it takes a lot of time to do a good job. Not a soul crushing, you know, lose your health, uh, marriage goes to pieces kind of amount of time. It, it can do that um, like anything else. Uh, something can become too much of an obsession, but it does take a lot of time. And so you have to be able to think about what kind of podcast, you know, how long it is, what format it is, does this, there's time connected to that. So here's a quick walk through uh, of what I need to do to put out a, a full episode of In the Past Lane. Um, so for each episode, I need to do a certain amount of writing and scripting so that I sound like I'm just talking to you, the audience, but I've actually written it out. So I, I and, and kind of internalized it. Um, even the, you know, the opening comments like, hey, everybody, how's it going? It's snowing outside my window here in central Massachusetts. I also, uh, I'm glad to be podcasting because I have 27 papers to grade, you know, like a little bantery stuff at the beginning. I have all that, you know, not word for word, but I got I take the time to write that. I also have to write an introduction for who the person is that I'm interviewing and on and on. Um, I have to prepare for the interview. So if a 400 page book lands on my desk, um, I probably don't have time to read 400, all 400 pages, but I have to read a lot of it. I have to spend three hours, four hours figuring out the book so I can figure out what the book is about and what kind of questions that I'm gonna ask this uh, author. Then I have to do the interview, which is about two hours. I usually take an hour to, to sit by my microphone and get myself organized. And then the interview doesn't always take an hour, but you know, from start to finish is 40 minutes, 45 minutes, 55 minutes, call it you know, uh, two hours. Then I have to edit the interview. To edit a 45 minute interview, um, can take hours to clean it up, to get out, cut out the, the meanderings to, you know, there's parts that don't sound so great or parts where the, the author repeats themselves. They sort of tell the same anecdote twice, one at the beginning and one at the end. You want to cut that stuff down. That can take a long time. And you can be obsessive about it, which I must confess I am. So again, with rebooting in the past lane, I'm going to have to put like a hard stop um, on, my, on my editing because I'm, you know, got compulsive editing syndrome, you know, where I want to make it sound so perfect. Um, Recording and editing uh, the episode intro, so all the little pieces, that little intro part, uh, maybe some of the, the, the things in the beginning, the outro. It doesn't take a ton of time, but it takes time. Then I have to assemble the episode. I literally, you know, put the thing together, start to finish, put it like a, you know, series of, series of audio tracks and get them just right and have the music start to rise as the segment ends and then put in a PSA, you're listening in the past lane and then fade out and it's into the next segment. You know, it doesn't take a ton of time to do that, but it takes, each of these things does take time. And then writing the show page. As soon as you publish the episode, or just before you publish it, you have to have what's called the show page, you know, at your website that tells everybody what it is and what, you know, books they can read and et cetera, et cetera. Again, probably takes an hour. And then I have to create media, you know, promo. So you can see here on the, the I've two, got two of my promo cards, one for the episode with Ken Burns and one uh, with another one with uh, historian Linda Gordon. So. Again, not each one of them, not massively time consuming, but then I have to turn to Twitter and Facebook and, and push these things out for the rest of the week. So that's uh, 16 hours of work, 16 hours to, from start to finish. All right, equipment. You could spend a ton of money and there are people out there waiting to sell you a $500 microphone. So what you need 
it, the, his, it, economists will talk, the phrase they use is low barrier to entry. You, what does it cost to become a, uh, you know, a podcaster? Almost nothing. There's no license. There's no fee, paperwork. You just need you know, the ability to put, it, put together some audio and then to upload it to a server. And that server will charge you, you know, 20 bucks a month. I'll get to that in a moment. But you're, you're the, the, the perfect microphone. I like to call this the Toyota Camry of microphones. I've driven a Toyota Camry for a long time. And before that, a Camry before. It's not a race car. It's not perfect. Um, but man, that thing runs 200, 250,000 miles. Almost never a problem. It's totally worth fixing. You know, and this is the same thing. This microphone has limitations, but it's, it's perfect uh, for, what you, for what you need. Um, so a good microphone. And ATR means Audio Technica. So ATR, if you just typed in ATR 2005, it's about 85 bucks. You need a pop filter, which is just a screen that you attach to your microphone that you, you've sometimes, you've probably seen this with, if you've watched music videos of studio, like it's a little little screen because we, when we we do any P sounds, it's called a plosive, a little bit of air pops out and you, it'll sound really weird in a microphone. So um, a, a pop filter costs about 20 bucks. Um, a hosting service, which I'll talk about in a moment, $20 a month. A website, $20 a month or, one of the hosting sites, uh, hosting services that I rave about is Libsyn. Libsyn creates a, a basically a website for you. So it wouldn't be in the passlane.com. It'd be, I think, in the past lanes forward slash Libsyn.com. So you'd have Libsyn in it, but it would be a great way to start a podcast without outlaying money and design. You know, it's, it's pretty intuitive in terms of its design. Um, and then editing software. You could spend $300 on an amazing life-changing uh, you know, form of a software called Hindenburg, which is one that uh, is really popular. Uh, or you could spend zero uh, on Audacity, which is free open source software. Um, like all open source, it's, it's, it's a little bit of a challenge in some cases, but once you master it, and there's tons of tutorials out there to teach you how to use it, uh, it's easy and it's amazing. Um, so you, you might not be able to like just open it up and get started, but with a little bit of help, you can. Um, hosting services, real quick. Um, the industry leaders uh, are Libsyn, Blueberry, um, and Podbean. Um, I love Libsyn, that's mine, uh, but the other two are, are, are awesome as far as I can tell. Um, they are the, you know, they cost money. And so th the next slide here, and this is being recorded, and I'm also happy to share the slides with you so you don't need to take massive notes, but um, the SoundCloud is a, is a service, and that's, I originally started on SoundCloud because somebody said, hey, start on SoundCloud, it's free. Um, turns out though that SoundCloud is really, there's two things with SoundCloud. One is it's, it's designed for musicians so that musicians can post their music. It's not a podcasting. It has so many things not there that a podcaster would want. Secondly, SoundCloud has burned through about $400 million in investor funds over the last 10 years, which is another way to say that is uh, likely a sinking ship. And uh, it's not like it'll disappear overnight and you'll lose all your episodes, but man, it's so much easier to start out on a stable uh, platform that is designed for podcasting that is not going to disappear. In fact, is, is only going to get better like Libsyn. You know, for example, with Libsyn, at a certain point, Spotify said, hey, we're going to start doing podcasts, you know, hosting podcasts. How did I get my podcast on, on Spotify? I, uh, I listened to the Libsyn podcast and they said, just do this. And in like one day, click, 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 my podcast is now on Spotify. I could never have done that um, with, with SoundCloud. Anchor is one that's made by Spotify. It's free. And I, I say it's not recommended only because anything that's free in this world, in, in the podcasting world, any of these free hosting services, every single one of them has disappeared. So Anchor has, has got more backing because it's, it's Spotify. So maybe it's worth it, but you have to think twice. I would say think twice about that. 20 bucks a month is, is well, you decide, right? What, what, what's worth it. Um, Editing services. These are things that can help you if you do have a little bit of income, a little bit of money. Um, I could offload, and I did a little bit uh, offload some of those 16 hours worth of editing to an editing service. So here's just uh, a couple. There are scores of people doing this. Um, I used Wild Style Media, but there are many people. They'll charge you a different rate. You know, they'll charge you $40. You know, like a minute, a dollar a minute. So if you give them a 40-hour, uh, excuse me, a 40-minute file, uh, for, say one of my interviews they'll charge you know, 40 bucks uh, to do it. But it, it varies. I, I don't wanna give you an exact figure, but um, 
for a while there, I was doing one myself and one, I had earned just enough money with, do, you know, uh, PayPal and, and Patreon donations from my listeners that I was able to uh, have one per month paid for. Um, find free advice. I've mentioned my pal Dave Jackson a bunch of times. Dave Jackson is the proprietor uh, and he's in the Podcasting Hall of Fame. Yes, there is a, such a thing um, called School of Podcasting. And so it may seem weird, but why not listen to podcasts about podcasting from the people who that's their job. So Dave runs a school and you can pay a lot of money for him to teach you things and him troubleshoot and all that. Or you could just listen to his podcast. Every week he has a new topic, discusses the newest thing, the newest software, the newest microphones, the six pitfalls that, that, un, that you know, undermine new, podcast, new podcasters. You know, it's really great stuff. He's a great guy. Um, the audacity to podcast is another one. And uh, the feed is one that's produced through Libsyn, the, the, the hosting service. So it's doubly helpful if you're a Libsyn person, uh, which I am. You can listen to it. And they again, they talk about everything that you need to know. So let's say um, Google puts out a notice about um, podcasts or iTunes puts out a new spec sheet about podcasts. You know, I might even not even notice that there, or I might freak out when I get that letter. Like, what does this mean? What do I have to change? And then you listen to the feed. They're like, oh, don't worry about it. That's just like some perfunctory thing. You don't have to worry about that. Or don't worry about it. We'll handle it for you because we host your podcast, you'll see a new, a new thing that'll take care of the whole thing. You don't even have to worry about it. So a podcast about podcasting are really great and they're free. Find community, really, uh, this is the, in some ways the most um, delightful part of it. I don't know what it is. I can't say that everybody in podcasting is awesome, but all the people I've met are awesome. So you could go to the big one. So every year there's something called podcast movement. I would recommend not going to this first, unless it's like, unless you're, you know, it comes to Houston or, you know, then definitely go. Um, it is huge. It's the, you know, the South by Southwest of podcasting. It's thousands of people and, and you know, it's the thing to go to. Um, and it's definitely fun and worthwhile. And, you know, you meet a lot of people, but it's just kind of overwhelming. I would recommend um, the junior version. So the plate where I went just a couple of weeks after starting my podcast, I heard word of mouth, somebody said, there's this small podcast uh, conference called PodFest and it had like 180 people in attendance down in a small you know, hotel down in Florida. And I went and it just changed everything. I just started the podcast and this is where I realized how much I didn't know. I also made a lot of friends. I met Dave Jackson. You know, I, 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 uh, I met royalty, really, Dave being one of them, but like people that were just absolutely phenomenally successful podcasters and they talked to me you know, whether it was at a session or in, in the hotel bar or anywhere, like you were just like, they, you know, a, a person asking questions. Um, really generous, incredibly friendly people. And PodFest has grown. It's almost becoming kind of a junior version of podcast movement, but it's, it's a ton of fun. It's a really great one. But there are other ones. I, I was just Googling around before I, I uh, jumped on this and noticed that there was something called Texas PodCon. So there are regional ones. Uh, that I don't know if this is come and gone and, and it's, a, it's a one and done, but there are regional podcasts, um, not too far, pod, podcasting conferences that are not too far away. And that's, you know, they're like any conference, they're fun. You get to meet some stars, you get to go to sessions about how to improve your game. And then you get to go to the vendors and they're all there with microphones and software and refrigerator magnets and all that cool stuff. Um, the other is the meetup. So I just quickly Googled, you know, Texas podcast meetups. These are just like Somebody goes, says, hey, let's have a meetup Tuesday nights at Freddy's Bar and Grill. And that's what it is. Every month, the first Thursday of every month or the second Saturday, and people just show up and they get to become friends. And you get, you know, again, a nice little community of fellow podcasters where you can share stories, troubleshoot, get some advice, you know, have, get some moral support when you're fading. Um, these are really invaluable um, resources. And uh, they, they are everywhere. And if you don't have, as many people will say, if you don't have a podcast meetup group near you, start one, you know, um, or if there's one that's inaccessible, start, start your own. All right, look at that. Now, normally I, I have so much to say, I go, I, you know, I go way over time, but apparently I'm sort of right on, according to my calculations, pretty much right on, uh, right on schedule. So at this point, why don't we open things up to, uh, to questions? And I think I will unshare my screen. So. especially during, well, there's two things that, I guess the one is I've started using podcast episodes, some of my own, 
but also just other excellent ones that, that are out there. There's so many good history podcasts out there. And don't let that intimidate you, right? That just means somebody's doing a really great job, but you know, it doesn't mean that the field is closed. So I will, and I have found that students to, are somewhat surprised, but they like, instead of you know, having just words on a page to read you know, for the next class, it's many, plenty of reading, plenty of chapters and things to read, but also you know, a, a podcast episode and it, it's funny when you just sort of say, what do we want to talk about today? You had, you know, these readings, this podcast, et cetera. Invariably, the first thing that people want to talk about is the podcast. Um, I don't know if it's because it sticks, um, that it uses a different part of people, young people's attention span, but uh, they really seem to, um, to like it. They also seem to be, I think the storytelling nature of podcasting has a, you know, has, so rather than reading an article about, um, you know, a, a, a dark moment in reconstruction, you know, they can hear a podcast about the Colfax massacre, which has both drama, but also several other elements to it. So I've quite a while ago started using them to supplement my reading uh, and other assignments for, um, for students. Um, but then with mostly with my first year student classes, um, I have thrown them in the deep end and said, look, we're all going to make podcast episodes. Um, and, you know, I, I'm going to pair you up. So everybody gets a partner. I, we have small classes at my college. So it's this is a 20 student class, so 10 sets of uh, twos. I let them pick the topic, depending on like if it's my Gilded Age Progressive Era class, um, then they, they, I say anything in that 1870, 1920 period, um, you know, and you need to research it and it can't just be a narration of a story, right? It has to, like, there's gotta be some payoff when we talk about that. I also have them listen to podcast episodes, not necessarily for their content, but like I'll have them listen to Nate DeMeo, Memory Palace and say, and then, we'll, and then we'll listen to a little bit at the beginning of class, say, do you see what he did there? See that move where he did this or see, or you listen to the interview and you, you can use, see the moves that the interviewer makes. They aren't just reading questions and recording answers, right? They're, they're, there's a certain teaching element to like the, the art of, of these things. Um, and so they, they, they write a, basically they write a short paper, then they turn that into a script and we work on how that works. And again, the different ways to craft it. Um, some of them get ambitious and go interview somebody. So they make that really the centerpiece of their, of their uh, episode. Two of my students a couple of years ago, um, it's, I can't remember what they, why they got onto it, but they were into lo looking at a topic of a, about the, uh, the opposition to anti-vaxxers. So the people that are trying to stem the tide of anti-vax uh, popularity. And they got a hold of this guy named Dr. Peter Hotez, who you probably have heard on the radio and on TV 49 times over the last year. He's a leading guy about vaccinations and a leading guy, you know, pushing back against with science against the anti-vax movement. Anyway, they got this long interview with him and, you know, both of them have been in touch with me since saying, can you believe that we got, <laughs> we talked for half an hour, Dr. Peter Hotez. So that can be, that can be kind of a cool uh, aspect to it as well. But then they produce them, you know, and I teach them how to, how to embed music and how to, um, if they, you know, students did one on a police shooting. So they, you know, they used, they, they said, we'd like to have gunshots. Is that too creepy? Like, no, put the gun, you know, do it the right way. Here's how you go find quality gunshot sounds. And so, you know, um, and then the last two classes, we just listened to them and it's, it's, it's great. And the students were like, oh God, you know, my mom listens to podcasts. There's no way I want to do this. And then the next thing you know, they're incredibly proud of it and, uh, and uh, feel a real sense of accomplishment. So. I mean, I think it's, you know, part of it is to, to understand um, the audience, like they're non-professional. So I do have fellow historians that listen to it. I know that. But mostly it's just people that love history and it's and including, you know, teenagers and people of all different ages. So, you know, when I've got the Pulitzer Prize winning historian, I don't want to get it too wonky or if he or she is getting too wonky, I, I, I try to find a way and I, you know, I, I pay attention to this when I'm writing my questions too, and I'm thinking about how I want to approach it to make sure that, um, that, that the interview goes in a way that is more accessible to people. If it doesn't, or if it goes great, but I feel I will do an intro section. So I'll, do, I'll add five minutes at the beginning saying, so let me set a little context here about this book that deals with reconstruction, you know, mm -hmm. kind of give a civil war 101 and, you know, et cetera. And then I, I will often sometimes say, here are three things you should be listening, three things to pay attention to. You know, so little cues like that, that, that situate the, the, the interview. I might even say something like, at one point you'll hear him say, 
X and you know, this is, you know, um, I, I can't remember, I, I know I've done it two or three times, but uh, to sort of indicate that this is what he or she is referring to um, because he's talking to me, he, he isn't. Or, or the other thing is I will tell the, the, the interviewee in our little pre-recording chat, don't forget your, your I say, think about it, you're talking to a smart NPR audience. And I say, forgive me, I'm going to, you know, I'm a historian, you're a historian, but I'm gonna ask you questions that may seem obvious, but it's, it's for that purpose. So in some ways you can kind of pre, um, prepare the, the interviewee to, to be giving more answers. And, and I guess part of that also, I haven't done an interview in a year, so I'm, it's, I'm re remembering this on the fly, is I will say, don't hesitate to, to define something. So if you are the interviewer talking about the, the, the rise of the second cl clan in the 1920s, uh, and you mention uh, you know, pro the onset of prohibition, don't hesitate to say, and of course, everybody knows, or in case you don't remember, you know, prohibition was the illegalization of alcohol, you know, just give a quick little, and that is great because people will, the best interviews will do those little inserts so that they, they aren't, they're sort of aware that I probably shouldn't drop a name or a big concept without giving a little, a little info. And if they do forget, that's the stuff I put in the beginning. But uh, the most important thing is, this is another one of these, don't pay attention to, don't, there's a ton of misinformation and it can be very catastrophic. You cannot use copyrighted music. Mm -hmm. So you, you have to use free open source music. If you had a podcast about um, minstrel shows and you wanted to play, you know, Stephen Foster music and, and have that, that's kind of a gray area where you are, or let's say it's a history program and um, there's a, Beyonce puts out a, a, a new song that has kind of a riffs a little bit on uh, the, the Selma March, or, you know, like some historical moment. You could, you could use like 30 seconds, maybe 30 seconds to be incredibly careful. And it's only, be, you're using it only because you are talking about that song. You're not using it to season your own, you know, something that you've done on Selma, right? You're saying, so that's how you can get around it. But I would say be extremely afraid of tripping wire because iTunes, if they find out that you have got copyrighted content, they don't send you a note or a letter or an email. They just yank down the whole podcast and you can get it back up again. But what if you've done 16 episodes that has copyrighted and it took them 16 episodes to catch you, you know? So mm -hmm. long way of saying, d don't do it. Um, free music archive is uh, thousands and thousands of, of pieces of music. Some of which is, is sort of old timey music, uh, a lot of which is synth, kind of techno pop and stuff. Um, but you don't need much, you know, if you want that kind of good, you know, what in the industry is called a bumper music, where it's just sort of sort of a little melodic music that starts to rise and then fall into the next episode, um, or to, to be the underlying music for your intro, you know, your pre-recorded intro, your, your walk-up song. Um, you know, you can, you can find incredible stuff there. It does take a little, it's a very clunky website. You, you can't just click on things. It's a little, it doesn't work so great, but everything is free and you download it and um, it, it's amazing. There are other sites. I don't have them at the tip of my tongue here. Um, I could get you, I, I have a, um, a document that has a couple of other sites, but that's the one I've gotten 100% of my music um, from. And it's been, it, it's been great. I think um, part of it is to, um, you know, when I started the podcast, I said, I'm just going to start this like I know what I'm doing. So, you know, episode one, I didn't say, hey, this is it. Um, I'm really nervous. This is my first podcast and um, I hope this goes well, et cetera. It's just like, hey, you are listening to In the Past Lane, the podcast about history and why it matters. You know, like as though it was episode 1000. Um, I just figured, you know, you'd want to have that mojo or whatever the thing is. It, it, and I think it, you know, that fake it you make it can be overdone or misapplied, but I think that is a, um, it's a good thing to, a good way to, it's a good way to approach certain things because people will take you seriously if you appear to be taking yourself seriously and presenting yourself in a, you know, in a competent manner, you know. I guess, you know, the thing we do is we do a lot of, uh, of I ask, I tell them to practice, you know, and to, um, I'll sit in the studio with them. Um, this, it's all these pre-COVID things, like sitting in a in a tiny studio. You know, we can't do that now, so they won't let us. But you know, you sit in there with the, the with the two students, um, and you can, you know, they'll they'll record a thirty seconds worth, and I'll say, well, let, let me show you how I would do that. You know, or and uh, some of them are amazingly natural at it, but try to demonstrate just that 
you know, what you said took 18 seconds, but what I just said, the exact same words took me 29 seconds, you know, because I, I wasn't, I didn't let my nerves make me speed up. Um, and I think also just, you know, another one of those, there is, it, it depends. There's no perfect voice, you know, um, I think I'm trying to think of an example, but there are many people um, just like there is in pop music. I mean, there are people that have like quintessentially perfect voices, but then there are people that have very raspy um, voices. There are people that use that in, in NPR that are uh, have kind of squeaky voices or a lot of vocal fry and that sort of thing. And I think people should just you know, really strive for a natural um, composed uh, voice is really what it comes down to. Um, you know, and I think the other thing is that students will find we're kind of surprised that the voice they hear in their own ears and through their skull when they're talking um, is it's just going to be different when it comes out of the speaker when they listen to it and and they can actually modulate it a little bit you know they can fiddle with the fiddle with the sound a little bit but um, I think you know it's, that's a teachable moment too because you know there was a time where if you particularly for women you know for women to get onto radio for, it took forever for women to get on the radio and then there was like a woman's the the acceptable woman's voice which is a sort of I wouldn't say masculine but definitely a deeper more resonant trend, not a high pitched, you know, not a, not a female voice, uh, quintessential female voice as it was defined say mid 20th century. So there's a certain, I think, uh, importance to kind of pointing out that in the same way that there were certain skin colors that were, um, you know, permissible and non-permissible or skin tones, um, that, that, that even vo voices, um, there's a history there, you know, and a, and a history that's connected to our social history. Well, I mean, in some ways, it, it'd be a good problem to have, right? That you're on episode 499 and uh, you're you're running think, running out of ideas. Um, I don't know if that's exactly what you were getting at, but um, but um, I mean, the beauty is that you're not unlike NPR or any other kind of scripted programming. You you don't have a a box that you have to fill. So if you have a 23 minute episode, and if, in fact, if you went through my catalog, you'd see that there's some of them are very short. Um, and then some that are bump up right against an hour long. So I think that's the, in some ways, the beauty is the flexibility of the format that if you have an, an excellent 18 minute interview, um, that's all it is, right? Little intro, little outro, or you could do a, sometimes what I've done is I've done a, the interview and then I've added a piece, a related piece. So if the interview is about, I don't know, um, keep using examples of you know the, say the civil war or something about Washington's administration, um, I could do a separate, like just narrated um, section where I write and do a sec do a, a feature on the Whiskey Rebellion. So it's it's just me telling telling that, doing a little bit of narrative telling, you know, to add another eight minutes or so. Not because I wanted to, had to, but because I because I wanted to. But I think that's the the key, the beauty of this is that there is no um, magic uh, number. It, it's really it all circles back to that quality of content, right? If, eight, if it's 18 minutes of content, you don't need to do any more unless you really want to. Um, and if it's 48 minutes, that's great too. Really good question. So um, I interviewed almost exclusively historians and historians who had put out new books. So, and, and by the time I started my podcast, those you know historians, at least their agents uh, and their publishers, we're aware that um, you know that you can only get so much radio. You might get lucky enough to get NPR, but the podcasts are kind of a, a really great way to um, to get the author before a large uh, audience to boost sales. So um, I would just email directly. You know, in my case, historians all are basically public people, so it was pretty easy to find even these Pulitzer Prize winning. Um, figures to get their to get their email addresses. And I wrote a kind of a pre-formatted um, email. So I, what I could do, I could trade on my historian part. I'd say, hey, Ed O'Donnell here, fellow historian at, at Holy Cross. Um, so you got a new book out, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, can we arrange to um, uh, chat about it on, on my, uh, my history podcast? Um, or I would contact their, sometimes you would get a pitch from the agent. So what, it, it's one of those things that almost in some ways builds after a while, the I still get Oxford University Press sends, and quite a number of presses continue to send me books and continue to send me, you know, queries. Do you want to interview this author? Because they they know that um, it's gone well previously, and that I'm an outlet, you know, for if I they want to get their person before the, you know, a couple thousand people, uh, then 
you know, I could, I, I would be one to do that. Also, they can reuse the, the they can post the interview uh, at their website if they wanted to, or post pieces of it. So, um, so I think it really comes down to just um, a lot of things like this. You would want to come across like you know what you're doing. You know, the old fake it till you make it um, thing. So, you know. Um, have that really well written uh, email, and if, if you can't trade on the fact that you're a historian, you know you could you'd find a way to kind of say I'm the host of a. I my email would say from day one when I only had you know seven listeners and I was related to six of them, uh, I would say I'm the host of a popular American history podcast. Popular is a, it was popular. You know I didn't say um, a a top ten or you know I didn't lie, but I said a popular U.S. history podcast, and that became true <laughs> over time. So. Um, you know, and, and kind of frame also in the in the in the re reaching out, uh, explain what you need. You say, I just need thirty to forty minutes of your time. Uh, we'll do it over the phone, and uh, I'll be recording it through Skype. Probably use Zoom now, but back in the day it was Skype. Um, but it'll appear to you like a phone call, and uh, etc. And bam, it. I gotta say, people are. You know, you write a book. You spend three, four years writing a book. You're pretty willing to, t generally speaking, willing to uh, talk about it, and then you can get lucky. Um, oh, that's the other thing. Once you get a handful of people, then in that pitch, you say other historian, recent historians who appeared on the podcast are Eric Foner, uh, Linda Gordon, and you so see, you do a little name dropping. So uh, you can't, again, you wouldn't want to fib because they could just look at your catalog. But once you get a little success, then you can turn that into, uh, into, into your legitimate, you know, raising your legitimacy uh, uh, profile. I probably, if I had five minutes, I could go dig out the photograph. But so what I did was I, I knew all those, 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 I had just that same amount of information. And um, I also have at the time, you know, four teenage slash college kids, uh, my, my children, and uh, all of them were in theater and there were set builders and such. And so at one point, at some point I realized they, they said to me, you can make any PVC piping is like, it's like the wonder thing of life. Like you can just, you can make anything out of PVC, you know. P so I just one day thought, I'm gonna go spend 30 bucks at Home Depot and make myself a, you know, a 12 year old boy fort. Uh, so I bought PVC piping, you know, eight by eight by eight. I created, I think it was eight by eight, basically a square, you know, with all the connector joints. And I set that up in my middle of my basement. I could have set it up anywhere. And then just grabbed all the comforters and blankets in the house and made myself a, you know, what a 12 year old kid would do for, to make a fort, put a little table inside, little bar stool, set up my laptop, uh, my microphone, perfect sound, you know, and that whole thing cost me almost nothing. And then when I was done, in 10 minutes, it was gone. All the comforters were folded, the pipes are up behind, stacked away behind the door. So um, that's, that's a good example. I have, um, I have when I went on the road, when I had to finish an episode, when I was doing, you know, traveling, I would, uh, you know, the, the metal frame that you can pull open to put your suitcase on in a hotel room, you know, it's kind of a Y shaped thing. Well, if you peel the covers off the bed, put that thing in there and then put the covers back over, you've got a studio right there. You have to record on your knees. So you have to kneel down, but put your microphone in there on the Bible, put this on the, on the use something sturdy and uh, your laptop around the corner and Perfect sound. So, and you can also edit out hisses and things like that. That those are really like super basic um, things that can be done very, very uh, uh, easily. But if you want to have something more like a studio, if you have a closet or a, a even a corner of a room, um, you can get you know those foam tiles. And uh, and if you're not allowed to attach them to the wall, I, in my basement I've got two sheets of plywood that I um, I, I created in the pass lane squares that were equal to the size of the thing. So it's this beautiful kind of alternating pattern of logo, uh, foam tile, logo, foam tile. And it, they just literally come together in, in my office. I have a, a, a you know, an L-shaped desk and they, they, they surround me there. And then it gave me, and I have a kind of a good um, drop ceiling. So that gives me all I need. I'll put a little blanket on the, um, a very thin blanket on the uh, table. So I don't have that hard, shiny, uh, reflective service uh, for, for sound, and the sound is great. So um, I think makeshift studios are, there's a hundred different ways to do it, but you just, you do want to make sure you don't have, you know, a, a, things you don't even notice until you, until you make a recording, like how loud is that air duct overhead? You never even noted, knew it was there, and then you, you record yourself, and you're like, 
am, is there a, like a jet engine somewhere that I, <laughs> you know, because those things make noise, um, much of which can be scrubbed out, some of which, you know, can't. So it sort of depends. Um, I, I don't know. I don't think so. Um, because I don't have, I don't use GarageBand. I know a lot of podcasters do use GarageBand very successful, mm -hmm. su successfully, but I don't know. Um, it's probably such a popular question. You could probably find an answer to it, but you would have, you want to make sure you really kind of research that question because like with copyright music, you'll see all kinds of false claims about, well, if you only use up to, a, if you use less than a minute of a Beyonce song, it's okay. It's like, no, no, no. Um, so I don't know about that, but I do know that if you just looked up free sound effects, you know, there's other, there are websites that post, you know, everything, you know, drum rolls and laugh tracks and um, gunshots and all of that. So there are other options, um, but I don't know the specifics on that one. Do, I think I've only heard, um, I think I've only heard positive feedback. So I don't know if that's just, that doesn't mean I've, <laughs> that the podcast is perfect, but I think for some reason, the motive, the people that are motivated are the people that are pleased or, or they, they say, I love that one. Can we do, can you do more on the civil war? Um, so, but um, one of the things that is a hallmark, that has been very, very key to people's success with the podcast is having a community, like a place where the, the fans can talk to each other. And so, uh, uh, Facebook groups is the way that that is that most people accomplish it. Um, you can have an open one, but you can also have a closed one where just so you can limit it to people that are, um, you know, you you don't want it to become, you know, history. In case you haven't noticed, folks, history can be kind of explosive. Um, so you you want to make sure that people are sort of abiding by, you know, community standards and and decency and that sort of thing. But that has become a big thing, and I was. You know, for me, I, I started a face, you know, Facebook group, but I never, it was one of those things that I just kept meaning to like promote more and to generate more. But, you know, for that to work, I would have to tap into it every day to, you know, even if it's just a half an hour, you know, but I could be spending that half hour doing something else on the podcast or grading papers. <laughs> so, okay. um, but that, I, I think that that's become a, um, a very important tool for, for um, kind of building that community uh, of listeners who all enjoy this podcast. They clearly all enjoy um, history and many other things. And um, and then, you know, that's the group. If you get that group to be a certain size, then that's when you say, hey, I'm giving a talk in Houston. Why don't we all, if you, you know, six o'clock on Friday night, why don't we meet at this bar at the, at the hotel bar? And I'd be love to meet you. And, you know, and podcasters will tell you sometimes six or seven people show up or two people show up. But they're super fans and it's tons of fun, you know, and so you can, you know, you, you chat and it's all done over and, you know, after after a beer or two. So I think um, that's how, you know, when you try to figure out how does a podcaster do a public appearance, you know, how do you like a live live show? That's how where that I think that's you'd be, having not just a really good podcast that gets a lot of listeners, but finding a way for the listeners to to uh, to meet each other. Mm -hmm. They, I just let them run, you know, I had, I have the questions I want to ask and, you know, I, I know that that's going to be around 40 minutes. So, um, and if it runs a little longer, that's okay if it's good or I have to do a little more editing. So with interviews, you know, it's a little bit out of my hands in the sense that the person talks and tells their stories and responds to what I, what I, you know, respond with and that sort of thing. But if I was to do an episode, which I've done, you know, I did a three part series on what was the Gilded Age. So, um, that one is 100% me, you know, writing up a narrative that I then, um, you know, more storytelling-ish, um, tell it. Um, partly it's time, right? You, it's, it's, uh, you could, if it, you know, 40 minutes of, of, of narration is a lot of text, um, a lot of writing. And, you know, it's a different kind of writing than writing an essay. It's a writing that you, you know, for the spoken word. So, I think I always, when it came to that, I was strove for something more in the in the twenty minute realm, mostly just for time conservation, because um, the in an interview, the interviewee is providing most of the content. But if you're doing a a, narr a narrated piece, 
it's you are general you're researching crafting figuring out you know like the way to tell the story the most effective way um so i would probably keep that out a little bit more in the shorter period so sometimes you know the determining factor is just how much time you have to devote to the project so better to have a 20 minute episode that's really well done than a 40 minute one you know i mean in writing it's harder to write something shorter because it you have to be more on your game um and but but that shorter writing often is better writing so a 35 minute not quite tight a little bit meandering narration piece is probably less less enjoyable to somebody than a really good 22 minute one that's maybe doesn't have quite as much information but is well crafted and you know ends ends in the right way you know sticks the landing as it were of it had to do with when i started the very first episode was a feature episode you know i just um i can't remember exactly what i did but i you know i did a, a feature piece on like this pledge of allegiance or something you know like the story behind this behind the pledge of allegiance i should i should remember what episode one was but anyway um it um so i i i imagined it being kind of like an npr show like where it would have three segments one of which might be an interview and then of course quickly on i realized that that is like way too much time for me to be able to do that. And then I also realized that I loved doing interviews. And if I can be a little prideful, I think I turned out to be a pretty good interviewer. Like I didn't realize that. And I think it's because I listened to, you know, 60 million hours of NPR uh, all my life. So I, I really feel like I sort of internalized the, the, the general principles of interviewing. So it turned out that I loved doing it and that I felt like I was good at it and getting better at it. So that then became, I thought, and that's also more self-contained. You're like, book a person, read their book, interview them, edit the thing. It's it's a little more straightforward uh, for a busy person, you know, with a full time uh, full time job and uh, you know all kinds of other things going on. So between time and doability, I found the and, and enjoyment. I found the interview part. Um, Really, sort of became the main thing, but then as very there was a there's a point at which I um, I couldn't do as many interviews as I wanted to because of time. So then I thought, well, what if I just put out a little this week in history piece, you know? So I began inserting that as like a, on Mondays, five minute this week in history, and that the, my theory was that that wouldn't take me that much time. That would also keep my audience engaged, and then every other week, so twice a month, they would get the big fat one, the forty minute interview with with the historian. Um, of course, that five-minute episode turned out to take way more time because <laughs> short is long. It takes to do it right, um, and so. But I experimented, and, and I guess that's another one of those rules of podcasting. Is um, my friend Dave Jackson? Uh, somebody told him once, uh, "You can change your, you, know, you can change the way you do things, and no one's going to punch you in the face." I, I can't remember the exact way, but it goes. So that's one of his sort of stock lines. He goes, "Go ahead and do it. No one's going to punch you in the face, right? If you decide that you're, you're, not, you're dropping interviews and only going with." stories or you're scrapping the stories and only doing interviews or you're um, going to be doing a 12 episode season instead of something every you know all the time no one's going to punch you in the face right it might not work you might lose some of your audience but it you know you can pivot you can you can reboot um, without really worrying about it as long, I think as long as you explain it to the audience you know which, which I did at, at various points like I'm trying this let me know what you think It's never come up, you know. Okay. Um, so uh, I think everybody who, you know you invite on understands what it is, right? It's mm -hmm. um, it's uh, it's just you know they think of it in the same way they think of NPR. I think you know that it's like it's a great opportunity to uh, promote my book and to talk and to talk history. So um, I think if I was, I mean, even if I was, you know, even like a, even let's say it's CBS Radio. Um, you know that you, technically that interview is being monetized because they're selling ads before it and after it. And if I had commercialized my podcast, even then, um, you know, I'm creating the it's my show, so I think the copyright resides with me. Mm -hmm. um, a author could, I think, if you were, you know, like if I got Stephen King or some, you know, Titan, they might be able to because they are who they are, make some certain stipulations. But then it would be up to me to say, well, I I can't do that because I I need to be able to just to push this episode out you know, or I can't give you editorial uh, power. Um, but every single person I've interviewed has always um, been very thankful that they had the opportunity and um, 
you know, enjoying the exposure. Um, I, again, you know, follow other people's practices, right? So I looked around and saw what people are doing. And so um, I noticed that whenever the history podcast that I liked uh, put out a new episode, they didn't just say, hey, new episode on Twitter, you know, on Twitter, right? It came with an image. And uh, tons of data shows that Twitter posts that have images are way more, you know, whether it's a picture of a sunset or whether it's a promotional thing, people are going to pay way more attention to that. So um, I developed you know, I just sort of patterned it on, you know, you put my logo, find a historical image, make it, you know, blur the image or, you know, fade the image, pop my logo, pop the cover of the book and, you know, cut in a little bit of text and in episode 99. And that was the accompanying piece that went out on Facebook, that went out on Twitter, that um, um, I don't think I was posting them on Instagram but at that point, but I, I would be at, at this stage. So, um, and there are, um, uh, software programs you can get uh, that will allow you to to you know with one click it goes Instagram, uh, Facebook, Twitter, and perhaps several others um, that make it really easy to do, um, and they're free. They're, they're they cost money at a certain point if you post you know more than ten times a week or something. But Hootsuite is the, probably the best known one, where it just makes it easy. You know you just open up and uh, upload the text, upload the image, and whoosh, goes off to all your accounts. So that can be, and that, you know, that just draws attention. I mean, I know, you know, it's labor and can be a little bit labor intensive, but um, I, there's no question that I built my audience through Twitter, um, uh, mostly through Twitter, you know, just, um, and, and then, you know, I guess all the other ways, but I, I know that that, the, the time that I put into it, and that's also where a lot of my feedback came from, where people would, would, ask me questions or um, ask for more of a particular kind of thing. So, um, or bemoan the fact that I put it on pause. <laughs> so. um, that's the ideal world where you've got a, a, a schedule and, a, and um, you know, an expectation for stuff that's coming up next. I would only tease or promote something when I knew I had it in the, yeah, I had already captured the interview, you know, and I would do that. I'd, I'd do three interviews in a week where, where like during spring break, for example, I would just grab as many people as I could and because I had the time and then I would slowly release those uh, over time. I was lucky. I never had um, an interview that, that got corrupted or that, you know, was unusable. Um, I had a few that had spent, I spent a ton of time, you know, the, the, Skype connection fuzzed in and fuzzed out at key, key moments. And so, so you go through, you know, like they're in the middle of a story and you can't understand the key word that they're saying, but it turns out they said that same word, you know, Nazis or something like that. You know, they said it seven times. So you go and you find a, you know, place and you copy that little piece and you drop it over and you drop it in and you sand down the edges and it doesn't sound great, but people can understand the sentence, you know, this 25 minutes goes by, right, in, in doing that. So I've had a few that I've, I've had to, um, I also had one amazing interview um, about the, uh, this story has gotten a lot of attention, but the William, Wilmington, North Carolina uh, coup in 1898, you know, white supremacists overthrow the local government. It's an incredible uh, story. Well, the, the historian had just written a book about it, but I, for whatever reason, um, I couldn't get that historian to tell that story in a straight line. Um, so, and, it, but, but the, my my phone um but i couldn't get them to tell it in a straight line so what i did i ended up doing was i knew the interview was so good but just you know the telling the story of a coup where the get the mob assembles and then goes to the newspaper and sets the newspaper on fire and then goes to city hall and i couldn't get the person because they would deviate off to another state so anyway i'd spent hours i cut it into all i wrote it all down on a piece of paper like i ma literally mapped it out and then i i said take this segment, move it over here, take this segment, move it over here, re-record a new question that tees up that, you know, so I would say, so this is the point when they go to the newspaper and set it on fire, because she didn't say that. So, and then she'd say, yes, and then, you know, or, or and then next. So anyway, the long and short is I had to like, like a movie, like I was making a movie with, I moving all the parts around. You listen to that interview now, it's a terrific interview, and you would never know <laughs> the lengths that I went to to, to, 
to, to make it right, you know, to kind of produce it, so to speak, um, including re-recording some questions that kind of kept it on track. But so that's, just, that's my only one kind of troublesome uh, interview that I had, but I was lucky. If I had had one that failed, um, I, would, I would probably have two or three others that were sitting there ready to go or ready to be produced. Um, because I wasn't trying to meet, you know, a, a, every Saturday morning, uh, kind of a deadline. Um, I just, that was impossible. I mean, I, I aspired to dropping them on a fairly regular basis, but, you know, um, I couldn't, I, I wasn't able to, uh, to do that. But I think it's, you know, it, in a lot of ways, it's good to have banked content, you know, to have a few, um, and if you're doing storytelling, you know, to have sort of, what are the next 10 episodes going to be ideally, and what's the order going to be ideally, and, you know, which ones am I going to work on first? Um, I think in any case, it's always good to have have some some backup material. I guess um, there was one when I was talking about different kinds of podcasts, one of my slides, and um, one of the featured images was um, Flatbush in Maine. And that's the podcast that is put out by the Brooklyn Historical Society. So you know, it's mostly, so their, their niche is Brooklyn history and they do all kinds of things, but that's, and their, their whole idea behind it was to put the resources behind that podcast so that um, people that can't get to Brooklyn, um, people who love history, um, you know, can, for whatever reason that that podcast can satisfy that, you know, that particular, those, those kinds of constituents. Um, there are other places though that will, uh, like, like I said about that making gay history, I mean, the guy who uh, did that, it was, he had his own archive, right? His own basement full of tapes. But there are, there's many a place that is now taking these things that normally somebody would make an appointment and come to the oral history archive and pop in the reel to reel, or maybe now it's been digitized and listen to the crackly four hour interview with Senator such and such. Um, whereas now, you know, somebody in that archive can, you know, can curate and, and can pull. Uh, let's say create a series of 20 minute podcast episodes on some theme like um, voting rights and they've got enough you know that that these people can can speak to that issue or um, LGBT history or whatever um, and and put out pieces of those interviews curated pieces of those interviews that can can be a you know a, a public facing part that somebody from Siberia can listen to so I think that's the um, you know, making more use of their collection in the same way that we, you know, archives are digitizing like mad because again, not everybody can get to the archive. Also digitizing allows for um, searchability, you know, things that <laughs> I'm old enough to, right over, right over there is a huge groaning file cabinet full of thousands of pages of microfilm printouts, uh, which at some point I'm gonna, I can't bear to throw them away, but you know, that's back in the day, that was how it was done. And it, I thought microfilm was a miracle. I'm no, no joke that it was the most incredible thing in the world. Like I could go and read every single page of every issue of the New York Times. Um, and, and I would, you know, had this fat index that would, you know, sit on the shelf and you'd flip to the index. And then, anyway, all that searchability, the same thing, you know, I, I don't think audio interviews would do the same thing, but audio interviews would, would draw attention to, you know, if you got a piece of that Senator's interview, interview it might be the thing that says, I want to go hear the whole thing or, um, and there are a lot of podcasts that actually do that, you know, not archival stuff, but um, there are, uh, if you listen to the podcast On Being, which is not about history, but it's more of like philosophy and ideas and such. Um, each time an episode drops, there's the edited version that is about 40 minutes long, and then the unedited version in the same feed. So you could actually listen to where they, you know, they, it's just like, hello, hello, is this Bob? Hi, this is Terry, you know, like, and, and they, and you can listen to the whole, the whole thing. So, um, I think there's a lot of ways in which, you know, archivists can use in the same way that digitization opens up their archives to the public. I think um, podcasting has that p potential as well. <laughs>